Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 33 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. For three decades, Mark McKinnon has been solving complex strategic challenges for causes, companies, and political candidates, including George W. Bush, John McCain, Ann Richards, Charlie Wilson, and Bono, who actually is, was not a political candidate, I don't believe, but certainly a cause. M Mr. McKinnon has helped engineer five winning presidential primary and general election campaigns. He's a co-founder of No Labels, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bipartisanship, civil discourse, and problem solving in politics. He has taught at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and the Lyndon, School, Lyndon Baines Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. He's a regular columnist for the Daily Beast and the Daily Telegraph, and he's currently a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Perhaps his most noteworthy pursuit was the time he spent in Nashville working as a songwriter with Chris Christopherson, <laughs> an experience he has described as wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> Mr. McKinnon has been identified by broadcasting and cable magazine as one of a handful of players behind every big decision in Washington, putting a unique, sometimes hidden stamp on the outcome of today's debates. In his presentation today, Stop Fighting, Start fixing, making government work. By the way, he was selected several months ago, and uh, here we are in this week of all time to, with that topic. In the ecclesiastical world, we say that's providential. <laughs> the presentation, Stop Fighting, Start Fixing, Making Government Work, he will offer his perspective on both the challenges and the possible solutions to the political paralysis and gridlock in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Mark McKinnon. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Tim, is, as you can see, is literally a towering presence, and this is fun for me because I actually get a little stool, and I remember I've had a lot of debate negotiations uh, for presidential debates where we're trying to sneak in a, a little stool so that, so that I look taller because I'm actually a little guy, so thanks. Um, I can't tell you how great it is to be here and not be in Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, as, although I've only been here a short time, it's very clear to me that this is true no-labels country in every sense of the word, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But, as Tim said, too, uh, the timing couldn't be better or worse, uh, given what's happening in Washington, D.C. And I just grabbed the Wall Street Journal this morning. That's just one example of many that you're seeing and reading. But here's the headline. U.S. running out of cash more quickly. Treasury now sees crunch by October 17th. No deal to fund government in sight. And one of the paragraphs says, unlike the previous budget battles that have consumed the federal government since 2011, there appear to be no backroom negotiations aimed at crafting a comprehensive deal that might offer a respite or even a small deal to get past the deadlines. And then, uh, is quoting Senator Mark Warner, who says, I think we've got this false sense of security. This time, the wolf really could be at the door. So, we are in a crisis, and uh, unfortunately, it's been a series of crises, and we've managed somehow to survive until today. But as we look at the road ahead and what's happening today, uh, there's a lot of reason and rationale for deep concerns. Uh, and that's, that is one of the primary reasons that we started No Labels. So let me, let me back up just a little bit. I want to just give you a little bit of bio information on myself. I know you're here not because of me, but because of the, the topic that we're talking about today. But I just want to give you some context about how I come to this table in this place. Uh, as Tim said, I had a wildly unsuccessful musical career. I went to Plan B at a certain point after I realized I was going to be the second act at the St. Paul Minneapolis Holiday Inn when I was 50 years old. And uh, 
Uh, and I ended up in journalism and I covered politics and then I started, uh, somebody I knew ran for uh, an office and I went to work on their campaign. And then I got involved professionally. I worked for some governors, did a lot of campaigns, ended up in New York with a of godfather of our business in media and advertising and got to work all over the world working for people running for president here and in other countries. Uh, and, and saw sort of you know, the real power of democracy, particularly in third world situations, and an appreciation for our democracy. Uh, then through an odd bit of circumstances, uh, uh, I ended up uh, uh, back in Texas, from Colorado originally, but ended up in Texas for, for music in Austin, Texas. And I worked for Ann Richards, who uh, ran for governor and was, was, and was governor, a, real, a, a great character. Uh, but at that time in Texas, there, there was really no Republican Party to speak of. It was, you were either a conservative Democrat or a progressive Democrat. And in 1990, I think when she was elected, every single constitutional office, and there was either 18 or, I think there's 28 actually, when you include Supreme Courts and the courts, they were all Democrat. Eight years later, they were all Republican. So as soon as the Republican Party was established, Texas is a very conservative state. And, and I had sort of evolved myself politically. I'd always been just either what you'd call left of center or right of center. I was, became a little more right of center. And then through an odd bit of circumstances, I got to know then Governor George Bush. And, um, and he at the time was working very closely with a Democratic lieutenant governor who was kind of a Lyndon Johnson type of character. And he, he wanted us, he connected us, and he was very supportive of his Republican governor even though his godson ran against George Bush, he endorsed George Bush over his godson. And so I just tell you that because uh, people don't really remember, unless you were there, what a bipartisan environment there was in Texas in the 90s between the Democratic lieutenant governor and the Republican governor. I went on to work for his uh, presidential campaigns, did all the media and advertising for both those campaigns. Uh, I then... Uh, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, I went to work for John McCain in 2008, but uh, I told him when I went to work for him that, uh, and I wrote a memo to this effect just to make sure, I said, uh, Senator, it's, it's an honor to be working for you and all you've sacrificed for your country. I'm glad to help out, though I have one caveat, which is there's this guy, Barack Obama, who's running for the Democratic nomination, and it appears highly unlikely he's going to win. But if he does, I would be very uncomfortable being your attack dog against Barack Obama. I'll still support you 100%. I'll vote for you. But I think his candidacy would be good for the country, and I would not be co comfortable as the person trying to tear him down in his candidacy. And I don't think it'd be good for me, and I don't think it'd be good for the campaign. Six months later, it happened. He'd forgotten, of course. I brought in the memo and said, Senator, by the way, remember this? And he said, right. And uh, he, he was very McCain-like and, and, and gave me a big hug and said, thanks for helping me get here. It would be very un-McCain-like for you to do anything but walk away, which I did. And it was hard to do. But then given the way the campaign went, I was, I was happy with that decision. Uh, <laughs> uh, but stepping back from all that, uh, having spent a lot more time in Washington than I'd ever planned or intended to, and having watched pretty closely both George W. Bush and Barack Obama, some very similar things happened to both those, as different as they are, both those presidents. And that is, they came to Washington with a real notion and an intent that they were going to change the culture. And, uh, It'd be a great story for a reporter to write to look back at the speeches from George W. Bush in 1999 and Barack Obama in 2007. And if you mixed them up, you wouldn't be able to tell which who's, was whose speech because they're so similar in terms of that message about changing the corrosive culture of Washington, D.C. Now, for some reasons, for reasons that are similar and different, they both hit the wall. You know, George Bush had the contested election. A lot of people didn't see him as a legitimate president, caused a lot of problems on his own accord. Um, and, and we know what happened. Uh, and, uh, and same thing with Barack Obama. You had the birthers who didn't see him as a legitimate president. Same sort of thing. Um, so uh, I, I began to realize that, uh, that there was something fundamentally broken in Washington, having watched both these presidents. And, part of, and it's, a, it's an interesting conversation that we don't really have time for this morning, but we could talk all morning long about why it's like it is. 
and there's, there's, uh, uh, I mean, there's the evolution of the internet, talk radio, uh, the media is complicit in all this, uh, Citizens United ruling on campaign finance, lots of, lots of things, and that's an interesting discussion, and maybe we'll get to that in some of the Q&A, but I want to jump ahead to say that any time that I'd leave Washington, I was struck by the fact that, you know, as I'd go to Colorado or Texas, where I usually am, that I had lots of friends and families that were self-described as strong Democrats or strong Republicans, and yet, at the end of the day, they would say, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't understand what's happening in Washington, because they know that even if we have to disagree, at a certain point you have to cooperate in order to make some progress for the country, particularly at a time when we have the challenges that we do. And that's the way it has historically been. I know we've had tough partisan times in our political history, uh, but we've always been able to, at the end of the day, tip, uh, tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, you, you, you name it. There was a time in which you say, okay, time to put the swords down, and it's not about who wins or loses, it's about the country and moving forward. And that's where things have become paralyzed. And again, we, could, we can talk, and maybe we'll during the questions about how, that, how that's happened. But I saw, as I uh, traveled around the country, that there was this enormous energy outside of Washington, which, I, which was largely frustration, and, and, and people being incomprehensible in, in looking at what was happening and saying, how is that possible? Well, it's possible in part because the incentive structures in Washington are all upside down now. And, and people are getting punished for what I would call adult behavior. Uh, and, and the wrong sort of people are getting rewarded by very vocal, mi vocal minorities that, uh, again, this is kind of going back into constitutional stuff, but because they can raise unlimited amounts of money, often undisclosed, they have an inordinate voice and an unfair voice, I would argue. So uh, what we wanted to do when we started No Labels a few years ago was capture this energy out in the country to provide a kind of an electronic blanket of support for people who we were described doing the right things. And right things means meeting with people from across the aisle, having discussions, uh, understanding that uh, cooperation is important in public policy negotiations. And they're just, they're, they're, that doesn't exist in Washington until, until uh, we, we cranked up this operation called No Labels. But it was this energy that I, I see in, in rooms like this, for people who are so hungry to, ch to, to do something about the paralysis in Washington, uh, as we see the, the as the public policy consequences get worse and worse and worse as we read in the paper every day. So uh, a few years ago, what we did is we launched this thing called No Labels, and we weren't really sure what we were going to do with it at the time. We just knew that we wanted to do something, capture this energy, and somehow apply that force to Congress. And, uh, and it's been a very interesting evolution, because at first, I, I'm a kind of a self-described radical centrist, uh, and, and I thought that there were lots of people in the country who, who have that same sort of ideological positioning, and I think that's true, and, and I could argue for reasons of redistricting and what have you that the Congress is not particularly reflective of the country. And so I thought maybe that's what the organization would represent, and, I, and we discovered very quickly, and I did, that um, you know, you get 100 people in a room and talk about what a progressive or a moderate or centrist is, you're going to get, a, you know, probably 100 different opinions. And that became just a very difficult conversation in terms of getting anything really productive done. Um, and additionally, we realized that, uh, that the country is polarized, that not just the Congress, but the country is polarized. And uh, that we wanted to, in order to be effective in what we were doing, we had to represent everybody. And, and then we had a kind of a discussion about, well, let's think about what are some of the systemic problems causing the problems in Congress? And, and, and I think there's some very clear systemic problems that relate to how we fund our politics, uh, back to this issue of how people, uh, how they draw districts, uh, primaries, and how they're constructed. So those are things we looked at, and we thought, you know, those are really important, and I, and I personally support all of those things and have other efforts that I'm involved in related to some of those things, but we realized, A, there's other groups doing that, and B, those are very long-term things. Those are five, 10, 20-year efforts, uh, and we wanted to have more immediate traction. And this is when we kind of found our sweet spot, which is we said, l uh, one of our supporters mentioned to me this morning that the, the media, and I'll talk about her at the end of the program, but uh, she spent some time in Washington and, and uh, 
the media makes it worse than it is. And to an extent, that's really true. The, because the media loves the conflict. That feeds the beast. By the way, I'll just tell you an example, a quick example of the media. I was on a media sh show with a, a, somebody that you're very familiar with, a well-known uh, television personality. And I was talking about no labels and what we need to do to bring people together. And we went to a break. And this person said, McKenna, could you just cut the bipartisan crap and give us some red meat? So that's, that's the kind of media culture we have in Washington. Um, so um, we decided that, that, there, that, there, that despite that, there were people who really wanted to work together and do the right thing. It's just that they've been conditioned so badly by this distant, upside down disincentives. So what we wanted to do was find a bunch of issues that were, weren't really Democratic or Republican, not really left or right. I describe them as more process issues that we could start getting a conversation, get people in the same room, and kind of start over and build some trust between the different sides of the party. And so we did a lot of heavy lifting on the policy side and looked at things that we thought that people might be able to come together on. And we came up with a lot of really good ideas. And uh, I'm just going to go through a few of them. And again, we can get to more of them later. But um, things like an up or down vote on presidential appointments. As, as you may know, hundreds, thousands of jobs in the federal government, including the judiciary and the treasury, are ha having a meltdown, don't have like half their people in their jobs because of this political infighting. I was appointed to something called the Broadcast Board of Governors, which oversees Voice of America and all our non-military communications overseas. I couldn't get confirmed for four years. And it didn't have anything to do with who I was. I was just a Republican George Bush appointee. And so the Democrats didn't want to let me through. And this went back and forth. It was kind of Hatfield and McCoy's fighting. But in the meantime, we didn't have a quorum of that board to meet to address really important stuff that affects our national security and, and, and a lot of other things. So that's an example, filibuster reform. For 50 years, over 50 years until a few years ago, the filibuster was used 35 times in 50 years. So not even once a year. Last year it was used 100 times. OK, so that's the kind of breakdown that we have, this jamming up government. Um, question time for the president, just like the British system. A fiscal report to Congress that they have to hear, read, and all sign, so they start with the same information. No pledge but the pledge of the oath of office. Too many of our elected representatives go in handcuffed because they have all these special interests that make them pledge to do one thing or the other. I mean, the most famous one is the, the Grover Norquist tax pledge. But there are, there are similar kinds of move-on pledges on entitlements. So if, if all our representatives go handcuffed to Congress and can't make decisions and deal with the environment as it evolves, what are we sending them out there for? Uh, and, and, and a series of others. Again, I, I, I urge you to go to nolabels.org and, and see these ideas. But the most popular one that truly reflects what the grassroots can do was an idea we came up with called no budget, no pay. And it's as simple as it sounds. We just said, the most important thing that Congress does is writes a budget and appropriations bills. And they're supposed to do that every, every session, right? And there's a deadline, which is right now. And uh, shockingly, uh, until last spring, and I'll talk about that, but the Senate hadn't passed a budget since the introduction of the iPad until this spring. And the reason that they did was because of no budget, no pay. So here's what the idea was. We said, simply, if our, our broad idea was that if, if Congress doesn't show up and do their job, which is to write the budget and appropriations bills, and like any business, the budget is a blueprint for what we do. That's how we plan policy. And so we said, if you don't do that, you don't get paid. Create a disincentive. And uh, of course, originally when we mentioned that idea, they were appalled and they said, that's ridiculous. You know, that, and, uh, but then, not only the, our grassroots supporters, but uh, uh, every, this idea suddenly popped out there, and people loved it. They came out of their church and said, well, that, that makes sense. If I don't go to work, I don't get paid. I don't do my job, I don't get paid. And just to give you an example of how powerful it was, so we got a hearing in the Senate. Joe Lieberman held the hearing. We, uh, but we couldn't get a hearing in the House, because the chairman, very powerful chairman of that committee, didn't like it and didn't want it to apply to him or his friends. And so he said, we're not going to hear it. And we said, You're, it's fine to hear it and say it's a bad idea. Just have a hearing. Have a public hearing. He refused to do it. And you know how hard it is for an incumbent congressman to lose an election these days? Almost never happens. And this is a powerful committee chairman 
who raised a ton of money. He got beat because somebody said, I think that's wrong. I think you should have had a hearing on this idea, no budget, no pay. And they ran on that idea and beat him. So, uh, and then this last spring, uh, as you may recall, another in a series of debt ceiling crises, the way that they got a budget bill out of the Senate is they said, okay, we're going to try this no, pass, uh, the, no budget, no pay idea. And that's how we got through the last problem, although it was a temporary fix, and it only applied to producing budgets. So the problem is we wanted to apply to the entire budget and appropriation process. That just applied to producing a budget. And, of course, the Senate finally produced a budget, but the House has a budget, and they haven't reconciled the budget. And that's part of the reason that we're where we are today. Uh, so, uh, but there's a great momentum behind making this apply to the overall budget and appropriation process. And if that were the case, I guarantee you we wouldn't be, have the situation that we're in today. Fast forward, um, we, the, here's the exciting thing for us. So I said that this has been organic and evolutionary, but what happens to me is I come to forums like this and I see people so hungry for this kind of an idea that just say, you know what, we can disagree, but let's get together, talk about it, and work it out. Um, so we realized that in order to make this really work, we had to have members of Congress working and invested in this idea. And we knew that that was a tall order, given every, all, all the environmental issues that are going on. And, but we knew it was important for us to ever be really effective. We had to get them involved and bought in. So this January, we announced the formation of what we call the Problem Solvers Caucus. And um, we had and we had a big announcement. We got, I think, 20 members of Congress to agree to be part of the, the caucus. And we said, okay, that's a great start. And, and quietly, our ambition was to hopefully someday to get to 50 members. Well, I was going to tell you today that it was 84, but then at breakfast I found out it's 86. So uh, we're really excited because what happened is that, and by the way, that's 86, half Democrats, half Republicans. And they agreed to, uh, when they sign up, they, th what happened is that they started having these meetings with their counterparts. And A, they, di they discovered that, so, that the people on the other side were actually some good people, good and decent people with honorable intentions and motives. And that they could work with them, that they could get stuff done if they had bipartisan support. Um, and so they went from meeting monthly to meeting weekly on their own because they found that it's so productive. And, and in the last three months, now you've seen what's happened with the rest of Congress, in the last three months they've written 17 different pieces of legislation that they call Make America Work, uh, and that's all moving right now. And they're also moving the whole no budget, no pay idea. So this thing is really kind of hockey-sticked in a way. And by the way, when we mentioned to the leadership of the, of the House and Senate, both Republican and Democrat, about this idea initially when we had 20 members, they kind of smiled at us, patted us on the back, and said, come back when you have 50, because they never thought we'd get there. Oh, they, they, I'm sorry, they said, come back when you have 70. So we have now exceeded not only our expectations, but a number that the leadership never thought we'd get to. So they've got to take us seriously now. And, um, and they are. And that's the exciting thing, is because when you have a block of that many votes, uh, that's the, you know, leadership understands that in order to get something done, and, you, and we've got a pocket full of 86 votes, powerful things can happen. So we had a big uh, event this, uh, uh, a month or two ago where we rolled out all these uh, Congress folks. And I, and I want to tell you that uh, I was really, uh, I met your senator, Amy Klobuchar, who's a member, and she's terrific. Uh, I, I thought she was just fantastic, complete no-label spirit. Uh, we, we also have uh, Congressman Rick Nolan as part of the organization. And we have a great no-labels uh, local community, and Shelley Stoner is the person I was talking about who, who gave up a, a month of her time to actually work at our office in, in Washington, D.C., but they've done a, a great job of, of working this at this level, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it end here except to say and go to questions, uh, but I, what I want to say is talk to Shelley, talk to the rest of our local representatives, get involved at nolabels.org, uh, because I think you have eight members of your congressional delegation and that means seven of them aren't, aren't part of no labels yet, and they should be. So that's something you can do is go to your members and find out, and just urge them to be part of this because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, we're getting traction, we're starting to get some results, and given all the, the chaos that's happening in Washington, that's critical. Thank you.
You're listening to Mark McKinnon, co-founder of No Labels, speaking at the Westminster Town Hall Forum in downtown Minneapolis. Thank you, Mark McKinnon. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast live from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on tw Twitter as well. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Mark McKinnon, co-founder of the Washington-based organization No Labels. We'll be taking questions from our speaker, for our speaker from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is Westminster THF, and you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I want to invite the radio audience to join us here at Westminster for our next forum on Tuesday evening, October 15th at 7 p.m., when national security expert Valerie Plame Wilson will be our guest speaker. And now, Mr. McKinnon, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. No Labels strikes me as a populist movement, and other populist movements in, over the years have tried to make change in Washington. Very few of them have made significant inroads. There's one called the Tea Party. Uh, can, can you describe uh, the impact of the Tea Party as, a, as kind of a populist movement? Is it, in fact, a populist movement? Well, it, it certainly captured the energy of, uh, of, of, of an important constituency in America, uh, one that is highly mobilized, highly vocal, uh, and, and again, it's been, been very effective over uh, the last five, six, seven, eight years, uh, not in ways that I, as a progressive Republican, uh, endorse, but it shows the power of capturing that energy, and, and again, there's there's a variety of reasons that, that groups like the Tea Party have been as powerful as they have because they've, they've figured out how to use the tools and the kind of the new money in the system to mobilize. And, and, and I think it's just, it's an example of what you can do in the current environment with the tools that are available. And that's what we're trying to do with No Labels is employ the same kind of tools, the same kind of power, and the same kind of energy. If one side in the political process refuses to compromise, and the questioner says, for instance, the GOP, <laughs> and punishes those who attempt compromise within their own party, how can we make any across-the-aisle progress? Is it futile? Well, uh, I I'm an optimist, and, and I think that uh, the fact that we have as many grassroots supporters as we do and people mobilizing is it, is it, I see it, I feel a tipping point coming on where people are fed up, they've had it. Uh, they, they, this idea of these interests in Washington simply shoveling sand into the engine of government uh, is bad for the country. Uh, and uh, what's happened is that people have gone from a, a place where they were, they may not have liked what was going on in Washington, but they, they generally became apathetic because they didn't feel like there was anything they can do. Now what's happening is that the consequences of this gridlock are so great that people are mobilizing. The people that are coming to No Labels recognize that they, they see the consequences down the road, like I just read in the Wall Street Journal, and they know that it could be catastrophic. And so uh, I'm, I'm compelled. And by the way, uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple of Tea Party members in No Labels. And uh, so our, our, our idea is that we get those people into a room and meet with with their counterparts and recognize we can condition them to understand and at least have a conversation uh, that we can change behavior and change the outcome. So that's part of our, our goal is to get everybody in the tent and everybody talking. And we think if we get everybody talking uh, that that's a great start. And, and that's what we're discovering. Money seems to be a particularly uh, key part of this problem in politics. What are the prospects of overturning Citizens United? Well, this one is close to my heart. This is, uh, this is part of the reason I initially supported uh, Senator McCain. I feel very strongly about the corrupting influence of money in politics, and I, and I think it just permeates everything uh, and is at the root of a lot of our problems. I want to just tell you a brief anecdote from Texas. This is kind of a classic Texas story. I worked for another governor before uh, Ann Richards, and when he was elected in typical fashion, his campaign manager 
became the appointments person, right? So the campaign manager who raised all the money now becomes the guy who selects the people who get all the jobs in government. Well, in Texas then, and now, unbelievably, you can give as much money as you want to anybody. You can give $10 million to somebody running for governor. So he was having a meeting with, uh, it may have been a, a counterpart from Minnesota. It was either Minnesota or Wisconsin. And it, so it was the campaign manager and appointments chief for the governor of Minnesota or, or Wisconsin, and w which had very different laws or has different laws. And so his counterpart said, yeah, we here, you know, you can't give more than $500 or $1,000 to somebody running for governor. And the guy from Texas said, wait a minute. Five, you can't give more than $500 to somebody running for, who's running for governor? And the guy said, yeah. And he stops for a second and shakes his head and says, well, so how do you know who to appoint? And he was serious. <laughs> and so, Citizens, for those of us who are concerned about money in politics, Citizens United is a crushing body blow. My hope was that uh, that, that decision, and for those of you who may not know, that decision basically said, you know, corporations are people, uh, are, and, uh, you, and, and it just it sort of struck down all of McCain's uh, finance reforms. And unfortunately, I think there's about to be another decision from the Supreme Court that makes things even worse because I think they're going to eliminate any caps on giving. So anybody can give as much money as you want to to anybody. It's just, it's just astounding to me. Uh, you know, I, I believe in free speech, but I believe in fair speech. And if somebody can give millions of dollars, like some people are doing through PACs now, and I can, compared to somebody else, uh, that seems to me completely unfair. The problem is that until the Supreme Court changes, it's unlikely that anything, is gonna, anything will change. And, and so we have to sort of wait till that up. That said, there's a lot of good people doing a lot of hard work on a lot of legislative and regulatory fixes that can happen that have to do with making sure we know how much money's coming in, who's giving it, where it's coming from, full transparency, full disclosure. So there's a number of other remedies that we can work on in the meantime, but it's, it, it's a very frustrating circumstance right now. And uh, so, Overturning Citizens United is probably not happening anytime soon, but it has to be done. But in the meantime, there are things we can do. Will our government work better if we push for and get public financing of elections? Yeah. Well, again, I, 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 I'm, I support the idea of public financing of elections. I, I think uh, the notion of anything, well, let me back up. Uh, I, I spoke to the freshman class of Congress that came in this time. Every single one of them. And for that matter, anybody else you talk in Congress hates raising money. I mean, there's very few people you're going to find that actually like raising money. And the numbers are astonishing in terms of how much time they spend having to raise money. Uh, I'd say on average it's probably about 70% of their time that they, they, they spend raising money. So that's a problem. <laughs> Right? They're supposed, to be, you know, they're supposed to be working on this debt ceiling crisis and they're out raising money for their next election. And if, and if they're spending that much time... So I, I'm for anything that, uh, that uh, reduces that imperative to raise money. And I think that uh, small donor financing, public financing, uh, there's, there's a number of diff different uh, mechanisms that Create, say, if you raise X amount of money from $100 donors, you get a match for that money at a four to one match. Just, just uh, good ideas that mean uh, that the candidates don't have to spend as much money raising time. So uh, I support it, and I think there's some good ideas. And so there's some states out there uh, working on these, uh, these kind of ideas, and they're doing it successfully. To what extent do the political polarities evident in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere merely reflect the culture of the U.S. today? Well, great question. I, I kind of touched on that earlier, which is to say, you know, I like to think that there's a bunch of people like me ideologically out there in the country who aren't being represented, and I think that's true. But to the questioner's point, this country's become more, uh, more, more ideologically uh, separated, and part of the reason for that, well, there's lots of reasons, but we've become such a mobile society uh, that people are clustering now among like-minded people. We used to have to live and go to church and go to school with people who were different than us, but now because of technology and mobility and a lot of other things, people sort of self-aggregate 
around people who are like them. And it reinforces behavior. And so I think for those reasons, we have a generally more polarized country. Uh, and that's why, that's part of the reason that no labels, it's part of our mission to make sure that we represent as broad a constituency as possible, but because that's the way the country is, unfortunately. Here's a question from one of our high school students. What are some strategies your organization, No Labels, uses to coerce, I would guess maybe encourage, would be a, to encourage uh, uh, congressional leaders to join your campaign of cooperation, the bipartisan campaign? Great question. Uh, the, one of the things that gives me a hope uh, and inspiration is uh, is the younger generation, uh, you know, the, the millennials and people who are now just becoming a, a voting age, people in their 20s, and they're people that I've spent time around the last few years teaching because uh, there's, there's a, they have a, you have a real different DNA, which is that you're passionate but skeptical. You recognize that there are huge problems out there have, that have been dropped in your lap that aren't going to be fixed through the traditional channels. And so what we're seeing is a, a lot of younger people are not going sort of to work for the local Democratic Party or the local Republican Party or the local member of Congress or whatever it might be. What they're doing is they're going to places like no labels. You can't believe the number of people we get who want to intern at our office. We had 70 interns this summer, and we have an office that's like a, you know, a third the size of this room, and we had 70 interns in there out of 1,500 applicants. Uh, but uh, but it's, but it's, the, it's that kind of power and enthusiasm that the younger generation who, who are going to nonprofits, very entrepreneurial directions, but very non-traditional directions that I think, and advocating for change in new ways that, that gives us hope. And so through a lot of their energy and your energy, the reason that we have 86 members is because people were using social media, a lot of younger folks, contacting their local representatives saying, you know, there's no labels thing. Sure seems like a good idea. Why aren't you part of this? And so it's, it, 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 when that fired up, that's when we went from 20 to 86. So it's been an integral part of our, our success. Speaking of social media, here's a question from Twitter. A questioner wants to know about redistricting. What, the, what is the impact on, on the extreme partisanship in our politics of redistricting, and what can be done about that on the state and national level? Yeah, it's a huge problem, uh, and, and arguably, uh, the primary, uh, one of the primary reasons behind the, the it, 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 truly hyper-partisan nature of the districts that are in, in Congress because uh, it's become a self-protection racket and uh, because in most states uh, you have what's called redistricting every 10 years where they kind of do a census count and reallocate the congressional districts and you have a bunch of politicians in a room drawing those lines and so they draw the lines in a way that protect an incumbent and if you have an incumbent Republican what you do is try and get all the Democrats out of that district draw it in ridiculous ways so you know I just found out <laughs> I'd been in Colorado that my congressman now in Austin Texas is from Dallas and I don't know how well you know <laughs> Texas but that's you know that's a long way away uh, so that's a huge problem. Uh, some states like California are experimenting with new ways of doing redistricting, which is they get a non-political panel. And sometimes, uh, I can't remember if this is California specifically, but sometimes they have judicial people involved. So they, it's, which is not to say it's a perfect solution, but, but they are looking at ways to depoliticize the process, which is a step in the right direction. Another question from a high school student. What's one idea you have to place restrictions on the ability of senators to filibuster without a specific reason? Yeah, uh, well, they, the, our idea is that they have to have a reason. And, <laughs> no, I mean, really, because that's, I mean, that's the way it is now. It's like the threat of a filibuster creates this enormous chaos. So the idea is that if you, if you are really gonna filibuster, then you've gotta actually take the floor and articulate what your filibuster is about. And so that, that, would, that would reduce probably by 80% the filibusters that we have now. What happened to Occupy Wall Street as a political force in this country? Yeah. Well, 
Uh, that's a, a really interesting idea. Uh, it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, although I will say that um, uh, I taught a course at Harvard, and I, uh, the name of the course was Disruption. And so I, I examined all the kind of movements in the country, including no labels that are trying to do things differently and, up and change the, the political dynamic we're currently experiencing. And I had somebody from Occupy Wall Street come to the class and he was fascinating. It was really interesting about kind of their, the way they uh, think about change and power and, but it's, it's, it's distributed. There's no real leadership in the movement and that's part of the reason that the energy is dissipated. But I do think that it was a, a, a powerful m movement at a critical time that drew a lot of attention to uh, to issues particularly around Wall Street that, uh, that I, think have, I think people uh, generally agree have yet to be addressed. So, uh, and, and I think that that's likely to be an ongoing issue, so I think Occupy Wall Street gets a lot of credit for that. But you know, the exact status of the organization right now, actually, I'm, I, I really don't know. And I'd like to know. Another question from Twitter. Do you think there's such a thing as moderate extremism? <laughs> Well, that's kind of why I, I call myself a radical centrist. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think in order, part of the part of the uh, part of what needs to be communicated, and I speak for myself only now, uh, that there's a notion that people in the broad middle of politics are not passionate, which is not true. And so I think that it's important for people who find themselves in kind of the middle politically to show their passion, to show their enthusiasm, to show their advocacy, and not to sit back because, uh, because, of, the, because, of, the, because of the partisanship, because of the redistricting. Uh, I, I think that we have lost a voice in American politics that needs to be returned, and part of it needs, means we need to be, get extreme about it. What do you do if the best solution to a problem is perceived as not a centrist solution, but rather one leaning toward one end or the other of the spectrum. Then we go with it. That's, 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 that's the exact purpose of No Labels, is to get in a room and uh, forcefully articulate our ideas. But at the end of the day, we say, we got to move on. And uh, if, if, the, if the mood of the room seems to be heading one direction, then that's, then that's the way we go. That's, that's, what, that's what our politics should be about. We get in, we argue forcefully our positions, but if we disagree at the end of the day, we don't just draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to play. We, we say, OK, we're moving on, and it's not everything I wanted. But progress is more important. Problem solving is more important than my party. One of our questioners wants you to uh, go a little bit deeper on the media question, the impact of the media in the US today on, on our political polarity. In other words, how did you respond to the, quest to the, the uh, person <laughs> urging you to, to uh, go for sure some red meat? I'm not sure I can say that on the air. The red meat, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the media and bias, and a lot's been written about, you know, is the media left-leaning, is it right-leaning, um, uh, and that's an interesting discussion, and there's, there's some relevance to that. More importantly, though, uh, the bias that media has is toward conflict. It's not ideological, it's all about conflict. What they want is red meat, just like that, uh, that celebrity told me when they went to break. They, don't, they're, they, they want conflict, they want fire, they want sparks, uh, and, it, and it feeds on itself, and it's a, it's, a very, it's a very disturbing trend, and I'm not sure what to do about it. Uh, I can tell you just another anecdote. Again, I can't name names, but there was a... There's a uh, there was a program, and I knew the producer there, and this happened to be a kind of a left-leaning show, and for a while, uh, they would have me and some of my brethren and sistren on uh, to sort of reflect a Republican point of view, Al although some of my, you know, Rush Limbaugh would say I'm a squish, uh, and not, not really representative of the party overall. Uh, they would at least make some attempt to, sh to show the Republican point of view in that program. And then this friend of mine, a producer, called and said, Mark, I hate to tell you this, but I was just in a meeting, and they said, we're not going to have any Republicans on anymore. 
and I, I said, well, you know, personally, I, 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 I don't care if I'm on, uh, but, I, but I think it's bad for you, I think it's bad for the show, and I think it's bad for the country that you've made an editorial decision not to show a different point of view. And that's just exacerbated by the technology that we have now today because we're all kind of living in tribes, isolated tribes, and, and I'm, I'm guilty as well. You know, I've got, I get up every morning and I have my little kind of internet sites that I go to and, and it's kind of leans a certain direction and, and it's not like the old days where we just had, you know, three television entities that had a, you know, pretty broad point of view. So people have to really work in order to expand their horizons and not limit the conversations and just deal and so it, what, we're sort of in a world where we live in what I call confirmation bias, which is we live in these kind of bubbles where, thanks to the media, we just get information that reinforces what we already believe. What's the difference between a progressive Republican and a Democrat? <laughs> uh, well, not a lot, generally. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd say that a progressive Republican is probably has different views on, I'll just take two for example, trade and unions. You know, I think that would be kind of a separating line, whereas a Republican would be more open about trade, not as restrictive on trade, and have a lot, a, a lot sort of more, a, a different view about uh, unions, particularly public unions. Is this the time, or will there ever be a time for a viable third party alternative? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I, w I would. <sighs> Yes, is, is my answer. I, I think that... Uh, uh, yes, this is the time, or yes, there will be a time. Uh, <laughs> I think I, the, the great thing about democracy, as messy as it is, is that I think that there's, there's powerful forces at work that can really turn things on its head. I mean, we elected an African-American president. We never said that would happen. Um, so. When the country gets mobilized or passionate about something, it, it, can, it can throw conventional wisdom out the door overnight. It's happened time and time again. So if what we see happening in Washington continues, sure. If, there's, if somebody's out there and says, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not going to be hostage to either party. I'm going to do things differently. I'm going to you know, take a different point of view. I, I, and I think that you know, obviously there's huge hurdles to do that. And, and an organization tried to do that in the last, uh, in 2008, uh, unsuccessfully because they just didn't get the right candidate to step up. But I think, given the current circumstances, given the environment, absolutely it could happen. How do you respond to this potential criticism? Does your block of 86 votes violate your principle of no pledges, having those votes in the pocket, as you said? <laughs> no, because we, they're not pledged to do one thing or the other. I mean, they're not, they're not pledged to vote one way or the other. All they, they've done is they just said, we're going we're gonna to meet and we're going to discuss and we're going to. So we don't know. Well, we have no control over what they do or how they're going to vote. Uh, so they're not pledged to any sort of action except to, to put their labels aside and meet regularly and try and create some problem solving. Question about candidates who start out in a, in a, a candidate in an election season as one person and then kind of morph into an alternative personality as the campaign progresses and especially following their election. Is that the way it has to be in American politics? Well, it doesn't have to be, and, and it's all about accountability. And, and uh, this, I got an interesting question this morning from some of our supporters about we, how do we make sure that people who sign up just don't use that as kind of a shield to go home and say, oh, I'm a problem solver, uh, you know, and, and not behave in a way that's sort of in accordance with our philosophy. And, and it's something we've talked about. We, we're not exactly sure what the solution is going to be, except that there's going to be accountability because we've gotten the kind of numbers now where we're going to say to our leadership, okay, this is fine, but if somebody goes out and behaves in a way that's contrary to our general philosophy, then you got to bounce them out. And so the, the, they've got to be accountable to the, the sort of policies and ideas and behavior uh, that we've outlined in no labels. So that, that's one way that we're going to keep people accountable. This is from a student in the audience. What can students or young people do to problem solve in their own communities? Well, uh, A, join no labels, nolabels.org. Uh, the exciting thing for, for us is to just see how this has taken off. And uh, as, as frustrated as I've been over the years, this last six months, 
uh, I've been really excited to just see things taking off and the, the, the interest that we have and the people joining and helping us fund this organization uh, has, has really um, uh, given me uh, a lot of hope and inspiration that things can change and they're, gonna, and they're gonna change in this country. So we've been so successful in Washington that now we've had some people step up some, some grant, we got some grant money and some other donations and people say, this is so good, let's take it to the states. So starting next year, uh, we're going to really start coming to places like your city and saying we're going to start having problem solvers coalitions in the local legislatures. So look for us next year. Uh, we're, I mean, I think you all do pretty well compared to a lot of other states, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you could use a little no labels activity at your state legislature as well. Uh, will the next presidential candidates from either the Republican or Democratic Party be part of the problem solving? Caucus. <laughs> we would love that. And, you know, I think that, I think what ultimately is going to happen is that, you know, the people who are in the problem solvers are finding it so rewarding, both in terms of productivity and the feedback that they're getting from their constituents, that I think increasingly, if not this election, then the next one, uh, I, I think it's very likely that the candidates will be members of the problem solvers. Would it help our system if the election season were a little shorter? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I like, the, uh, I like the British model, and I think it's the British model, but th there's, there's certainly foreign models that I've seen where 60 days, that's the election. You know, all the advertising, all the debates, everything happens within a 60-day window. So, yes, I, I, I'd love to see it shortened somehow. Time for one final question. Are you hopeful about American democracy? I'm really hopeful. I'm inspired by what we've seen. As I said, it's, a, it's frustrating when you look at Washington, particularly the way the media portrays it, but I'm convinced uh, having dealt with these 86 people who are now in the Problem Solvers Caucus, that they're good people with good intentions. They just needed a little cover. And the more cover we provide, the better our democracy is going to get. Thank you, Mark McKinnon.